You are watching Programming from the East-West Center in Washington, D.C. Well, good evening from Washington, D.C., and welcome to the East-West Center's online webinar series. Uh, today, we have a very, very interesting program with uh, a number of rising specialists on U.S.-Japan relations uh, based both in uh, the United States and in Japan. Uh, many of them currently based in Japan, so good morning to you, I guess, uh, and welcome. And for those of you joining us either on YouTube or on Zoom, uh, welcome to you all. Uh, the program's title today is Enduring and New Frontiers in U.S.-Japan Relations, and it was really an effort to take stock of the range of ways in which the U.S. and Japan interact. And we have a, a number of scholars who have uh, diplomatic background, private sector background, academic background, as well as a, a expertise in a range of fields. And we've been delighted to work with Paul Nadeau of the Tokyo Review in preparing this set of uh, special articles and analyses and to bring you this program. And therefore, I do want to welcome him specially as, along with all of the, uh, the, the authors and uh, invite him to make a few remarks before we kick off um, and with each of them giving just, we have a couple of papers that uh, presenters that weren't able to join us based on their articles, but many of them are here and we want to give them a few minutes to go over their key findings and then invite our, our participants to engage with us as well. Paul, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lamaye, and good morning, everyone from Tokyo, where I'm happy to report it's uh, cherry blossom season. It's one of the nicest times of the year, and I'm especially excited because I've got a nice view of some cherry blossoms and peach blossoms, which I almost like better, to be honest, uh, from my own off home office window. So it's a nice little bonus if you're going to be stuck at home. But I want to say thank you to everyone who's joining us. Uh, I want to say thank you to the East West Center and Dr. Lamaye and Sarah Wong, Peter Valenti for helping us you know, with all the legwork to get this off the ground. And more than anyone, I want to thank our contributors who've contributed an excellent range of topics covering US-Japan relations for the coming four years that don't just hit on the usual security and economics dimensions. Not that those aren't important because of course they are, but the US-Japan relationship really touches on more things, more issues than I think a lot of people often appreciate. You know, things like social justice issues, uh, subnational relations in between state and local governments, um, dual citizenship. We, I'm very sorry we couldn't have the author of that piece join us uh, because I think that's also a very significant issue for both the United States and Japan. So I'm very happy that uh, we'll have the chance to you know, share our uh, papers and elaborate on them a little bit and more than anything else, respond to some of your questions. And I, I hope we have a good conversation and uh, thank you all once again. Well, thank you, Paul. Yes, uh, absolutely terrific range. And I just want to flag that the East West Center has a couple of uh, several programs on Japan. Uh, but one in particular that we just completed was the Congressional Staff Program on U.S.-Japan Relations for young staffers on Capitol Hill. And I just want you to know that these papers were part of their assigned readings and uh, available materials for them as well. So we're kind of helping to um, uh, sort of engage a new generation of folks who will be working on the U.S.-Japan Alliance from a myriad of, of topics and perspectives. So this is really a welcome addition to the field. Uh, with that, you, for folks, um, please refer to your invitation for all the detailed bios. If I were to go through the accomplishments, experience, expertise of each of our presenters, it would take the whole session. Uh, so I would ask you to refer to that. I really want to give them a chance uh, to highlight their findings. And so we'll kick off right away with the, with the first um, uh, paper, which deals on, uh, which addresses subnational issues in the US-Japan relationship. And um, that is by uh, Sean Connell and um, uh, Ms. Seeloff, so Sarah Seeloff. So please, Sean and uh, Sarah, may I invite you to make your opening remarks and then uh, we'll go to the next paper. Well, uh, th thanks Satu and Paul. Sarah and I appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this series. And it's uh, great to be back virtually at the East West Center in Washington. Our paper argues that subnational diplomacy, by which we mean the international activities of states, cities, and other subnational actors, represents an increasingly important force within international relations. It demands federal leadership and resources, 
And the US-Japan relationship offers a laboratory for developing and implementing new models of subnational cooperation. We believe this can deliver benefits locally, nationally, and globally because cities, states, and regions have long been incubators for creative policy solutions that frequently spawn larger models. I'd like to address the obvious question, isn't international engagement a distraction in the middle of a global pandemic? And the answer is no. Subnational actors no longer have a choice about whether to participate in a globalized world, and they should be positioned for success, able to leverage international engagement to their benefit. Subnational diplomacy has furthermore evolved beyond cultural exchange to include increasingly sophisticated and diverse activities that range from technology-driven entrepreneurship to environmental quality and disaster resilience. And this delivers concrete benefits to participants on both sides of the Pacific, especially in areas where national governments may not be best positioned to engage, such as local economic development. In keeping with today's theme, robust subnational engagement is both an enduring and expanding element of the U.S.-Japan relationship, one that strategically positions the two countries to identify new approaches to big, unprecedented challenges ranging from pandemics and climate change to economy and energy transitions. Let's look at a few examples of this. For starters, inclusive economic development is an urgent priority for US and Japanese municipalities, urban and rural. Local governments on both sides of the Pacific seek to boost resilience, foster new businesses and economic drivers, and attract people to depopulating communities. Many of these challenges are common, even if the context differs, and can offer replicable solutions and models across borders. Some recent examples that come to mind include community-based innovation and entrepreneurship networks working in smaller communities in Washington State, where I'm based, in partnership with local governments to engage dislocated workers as well as small business mentors. Also in Japan, workcation facilities that are bringing urbanites and their skills to small and often depopulating municipalities with the goal of forming longer term relationships, including as residents. This trend has accelerated during the pandemic. These examples could have utility in both countries and subnational networks can facilitate sharing this information with other communities that may find it an attractive and relevant model. We share in our paper and are happy to discuss in more detail afterwards, some examples of recent state and regional led economic initiatives focused on connecting US and Japanese entrepreneurs and capital, for instance, that could also form new frameworks for engagement around inclusive economic development and community revitalization. Thanks, Sean. Another example of a problem that can benefit from subnational exchange is that of shrinking cities, where cities are depopulating and their economies are often shrinking. And this is pronounced more pronounced in Japan due to national population decline, but it's also familiar to local officials across the United States. And the problem here is that we know how to grow cities, but we don't know how to shrink them very well. Japan is a living laboratory for efforts to decipher what a sustainable shrinking city can look like. Subnational cooperation offers US partners access to the latest strategies and thinking around this growing and global challenge. These kinds of approaches are also beneficial for global efforts to address climate change. And this is an arena in which US and Japanese states, prefectures and cities have increasingly and really have a long history of taking leadership. Uh, for example, some of you will be familiar with initiatives such as the Hawaii-Okinawa Clean Energy Partnership, which during the past decade brought together the state of Hawaii, Okinawa Prefecture, the US Department of Energy, Medi in Japan to develop and disseminate renewable energy information and technology solutions that can be deployed in island and other remote communities. Expanding opportunities to engage and learn from each other can generate policy solutions for US and Japanese communities alike. And to realize the full potential of subnational diplomacy within the bilateral relationship and in US foreign policy more broadly, we need increased strategic coordination and resources at the federal level. Our recommendation is that this take the form of a new office or an interagency mechanism within the federal government to institutionalize and support these initiatives and to ensure alignment with national foreign policy strategies. This could be a significant force multiplier to first to democratize subnational engagement, and second, to increase direct linkages between US foreign policy and benefits for the American middle class, which is a priority for the Biden administration. 
I just also want to note that we're not alone in making this recommendation. During the Obama administration, there existed a State Department Office of Global Intergovernmental Affairs, so there is a precedent for this. And in 2019, the City and State Diplomacy Act was introduced in Congress, and this would establish an Office of Subnational Diplomacy within the U.S. State Department. And since the Biden administration has taken office, there have also been a growing number of experts and papers calling for more federal engagement around subnational diplomatic activity. So we need a federal officer network that can engage daily across the whole of the federal government and connect struggling and successful municipalities with ideas and models to harness this power of subnational exchange. And those models do exist before. I worked for one during the Obama administration called the White House Council on Strong Cities, Strong Communities, and I'm happy to address in detail later what that model looked like. In closing, while sustainable subnational relationships develop organically uh, and require leadership from local participants, the federal government has an interest in facilitating effective subnational diplomacy. And this will further strengthen US foreign policy and the resilience of relationships connecting the United States with Japan and other global partners. Thank you. Thanks, we look forward to everyone's questions. Well, that's, that's terrific, uh, Sarah and Sean. That's, it's, a, it's a subject uh, near and dear to my heart because of our Asia Matters for America series. We've been working with a lot of caucuses in Capitol Hill on their respective interests in various parts of Asia. And we uh, map as well as track relations between uh, every US state and every congressional district with Asia, uh, whether that be Korea, India, ASEAN, Japan, et cetera. So I hope you'll, some of our participants will take a look at the Japan Matters for America. And we've talked about this across prefectures in Japan, as well as US states. So that's terrific. I have, have lots of questions for you about how particularly this cities are attracting people because there's in the COVID environment in the US, many medium and second tier cities are seeking ways to meet folks needs to move out of large urban centers and, and, and provide uh, uh, working space. And I wonder if, there were opportunities for Japan and US to share, um, you know, share some of those lessons. Uh, but onward we go with our next colleague who is currently on leave from the State Department, and that's Hillary Dower, who has been working on Okinawa issues, a kind of subnational and yet national and yet bilateral issue all in, rolled into one. So uh, Hillary, take us away on Okinawa and where we are and where we might go. Oh, thank you so much. And, and also, I want to express my thanks to both you, Satu, and Paul for this wonderful opportunity. Um, uh, as Satu mentioned, uh, I'm a Foreign Service officer currently on leave. So I just have to say at the top that anything I say today, say today reflects only my personal views and not those of the US government. So in terms of background, um, until August of last year, I was the Deputy Consul General at the US Consulate General in Naha, Okinawa. Uh, and immediately before that, I was uh, seconded to the Japanese Foreign Ministry. So at the time, a lot of my colleagues in the Japanese Foreign Ministry made the joke, oh, Okinawa, that's going to be the apology tour. So um, and it, in, in many ways, unfortunately, that turned out to be true, um, given the frequency uh, of U.S. military incidents and or accidents. Sometimes we would have two to three protests uh, per week. So I think what's unfortunate is that this view of Okinawa affects policymakers both in Washington and Tokyo, and they sort of think that Okinawa is monolithically anti-US, anti-alliance, and anti-base. But I, I think none of those three things are true. So just to give you a little uh, vignette, you know, these are called protests, but really you have local politicians come in, they'll ask for 30 minutes of the Consul General's time or my time, They'll read a prepared statement uh, which expresses their demands. And then there'll be, you know, another, say, 10 to 15 minutes where they can sort of speak, you know, and give and give some sort of canned speeches. But these are very sort of, you know, well-timed, well-mannered, um, very, very sort of, you know, um, uh, polite uh, protests. And when you look through the demands that they have on their protests, it's actually quite interesting. You can go through each of the specific demands. Okay, demand number one, well, okay, that's sort of reasonable. Demand number two, well, we're already sort of doing that. It'll be something like demand number three, remove all US forces from Okinawa immediately. Well, I'm sorry, that's not gonna happen. And then it'll be a fourth demand, which again, it, it seems either reasonable or something we're already doing. Um, so just to give a quick uh, uh, illustration, there was this one socialist 
um, prefectural assembly member. Um, and he had some specific demand about, well, I want a full report on this specific part in the Osprey. And I sort of looked at it like, well, that's probably, you know, um, publicly available information. So that should be easy enough. So I went to go visit him and he said, you know what? Don't even need to bother with giving me all this detailed information. Really, I just want a tour, a base tour of Tenma Air Base. And I was like, oh, well, that's simple enough. So the point I'm trying to make here is that although they're described as protests, really, I think a better way to look at them are invitations to dialogue. Um, and unfortunately, it took me my entire three years to sort of figure out that's what or that's the way to look at them. Um, so if they are invitations to dialogue, what should be the content of this dialogue? And I think and this isn't really a revolutionary idea, but simply have public information sessions where both the US and Japanese side can explain why the bases exist in Okinawa in the first place. And I think the uh, GAO report that came out last week is was a great, you know, a great uh, material to sort of base that kind of discussion around, right? It, that report talks about how the bases strengthen security in the region, how it strengthens the alliances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think a second possible topic for uh, discussion are some of these new um, emerging security challenges, especially in the Indo-Pacific region, whether it's cybersecurity or the security of global supply chains, AI, space, infrastructure. Um, and, and as a diplomat, I mean, I think these are all really exciting sort of cutting edge areas that traditional diplomacy didn't didn't touch. So again, interacting with the people of Okinawa to sort of explain some of the emerging challenges will help to make them feel like they're you know, being treated as full partners in the alliance. And it helps to uh, helps them understand in a sort of indirect way of um, challenges emerging in, in, the, in the region as well, uh, without actually explicitly saying China in any of these in any of these discussions. Um, and thirdly, I think what would be really useful is to invite other nations in the Indo-Pacific region to share their views of the security situation. Um, and, and, you know, countries like Indonesia or Malaysia or India, Vietnam. And I think as they start to share both their concerns about what's going on in the region, but also some of the, the quote unquote burden that they have to take um, in order to meet these new challenges will help the Okinawan people see that they're not alone um, in playing a part and contributing to security in the region. And especially with, with sort of third party countries, say like in Indonesia and India, I think their views would be, would be viewed as credi credible amongst Okinawan people because they're seen as neutral. Um, not pro-US, not pro-China, but sort of down the middle. So I think that would add credibility um, to what they're saying, but also help Okinawans see that they are part of a larger, they're a larger uh, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, region in which there are a lot of very, very challenging um, security uh, um, developments. So that's sort of the crux of my paper and I look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Hillary. I was particularly taken by the point on the GAO report that was issued last week. We, in fact, at the East West Center hosted the entire GAO team yesterday for a lunchtime talk on the findings of the report. And I can tell you there were an awful lot of uh, Okinawa organizations, uh, Okinawa related um, uh, NGOs and others uh, participating in that call. We had almost 96, 97 folks on that call. So uh, that issue attracted a lot of attention. I particularly want to flag your point and come back to it. So I'm just giving you a preview on the issue of uh, the US-Japan alliance is a public good uh, for the region, which is something that has not been, I think, uh, sufficiently enough appreciated um, and is beginning to be appreciated in this new contested uh, Indo-Pacific environment, particularly in countries as as wide ranging as in Southeast Asia and South Asia, such as India. So let's come back to that, but thank you, Hillary. And uh, that was terrific. Uh, may we now go to Professor uh, Tom Lay, who's going to address his paper on uh, the role of the United States in the Japan ROK relationship, uh, particularly history issues. Professor, please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to first thank 
uh, Tokyo Review and the East West Center for this opportunity. Uh, you know, as a Californian, I always feel like we're in exile and separated from where all the action is. So it's kind of nice to be connected with everybody. Uh, so my paper is about, it makes a case for why the Biden administration should take a more active role in helping South Korea and Japan deal with their history issues. And um, it's, a, uh, it's a carve out of a policy note and a peer reviewed paper that I'm working on that's currently supported by Korea Foundation and the Graves Award. So there's gonna be a theoretical dimension and then a policy dimension. And uh, it's based on a couple of premises and hopefully it'll be shown in this uh, discussion. First is I don't buy the argument that's kind of popular in the academic literature that there's a fundamental anti-Japanese uh, element in Korean identity that makes reconciliation impossible. Because I think if that's the case, then it doesn't explain how agreements were already achieved several times in the past, right? And it also doesn't explain polling data that shows both sides considers the relationship uh, particularly important. The problem has been not the ability to agree that the relationship is important and reconciliation is important, it's getting those deals to stick, right? So that's a policy issue. How do you come up with language and strategy to prevent backsliding? Uh, the, the second dimension of that is uh, I try to develop a, a theory of reconciliation that looks at why you have to do extra work over time. Uh, and I use the, the concept of debt to explain why you have to work extra hard. So for instance, if we consider Japanese colonization uh, as the original sin, uh, fixing that is not simply addressing that problem because we went decades without addressing it. So over time that takes on a character of its own. And if you're gonna do a policy prescription, you have to kind of address how the problem evolved over time. And that's what I, I try to do. And the third dimension is I try to come up with very common sense reasons on why all three sides have an incentive to cooperate uh, as opposed to you know, the many obstacles that people point to. Um, it's very important that the United States plays this role in managing the alliance on the history issue. We spend so much time talking about base sharing, how much money should each side spend. And we only look at that part, but we see a lot of times disagreements between our two allies such as information sharing and things such as that is tied to the history issue. You have to manage these alliances in all its ways. And I don't think it's that impossible to fix because if the US is gonna spend a significant amount of time trying to get North Korea to get rid of its nuclear weapons, when theoretically and empirically they've given us reasons why they don't wanna do it, we find it still something worth pursuing. I think working with our two democratic allies on this important issue makes it uh, quite reasonable, right? So if we uh, take a look, um, at the brief history for this article, I kind of focus on past 2015. That's when South Korea and Japan came up with the Comfort Women Agreement, right? And it was a series of uh, secret meetings uh, where both sides were able to, uh, you know, agree to not criticize each other in international fora. And also Japan provided some compensation uh, for the Comfort Women. And they designed it in a way that was different from the Asia Women's Fund, right? They gave the money directly to Korea and then said, you do what you will with it, as opposed to the, the 90s agreement where Japan did it um, separately on its side. And so that's a step in the right direction. But what we saw with that deal is it quickly fell apart because uh, on the Korean side, the comfort women were not invited to the negotiating table, so you didn't have the relevant stakeholders. And the bigger problem was that the deal itself didn't have specific language that explains what happens when one side doesn't meet its obligations. Or it didn't give a roadmap on, for the Japan side, they wanted to remove these comfort women statues. And there was a kind of a off the record agreement, but not an actual roadmap. So we can identify there that if there's gonna be an agreement, those are two problems that can be addressed. Uh, another uh, issue with that agreement was that there was nothing built in that had to do with backsliding. What if one side kind of violates the nature of the agreement? What, what is the penalty there? Or, um, uh, and then uh, relatedly, there was nothing that was forward looking about it. So this is where I felt like the, the Japanese side may have overreached where they said this deal kind of solves it finally and irreversibly. Uh, the thing is, uh, there is no final and irreversible with the post-war period. You're always post-war. It's something that you're always dealing with. And so I think it's, if we think of um, reconciliation in terms of debt, right, where when you have debt, you pay off the principal, but if you didn't do it immediately right away, you have to pay off interest, right? You don't just pay off the principal and nothing kind of builds off of that. So because Japan and South Korea didn't have an agreement until 1965 to even like address uh, the relationship after the war, you know, we had a couple of Korean administrations that were very anti-Japanese and it was very uh, useful to them politically. And that does take on its character. So over time, you have to kind of take into those developments and come up with policies 
in which you could you know, improve relations as opposed to just, just addressing the past. So those are some of the kind of strategic things to think about. Why I think the United States should step in is, well, one is this is, you know, um, if Trump was criticized, uh, President Trump, the, the last administration was criticized for having a very trans transactional approach in IR and just, you know, and not really fully invested or very um, well informed about the, the politics and the history of the region, the Biden administration is the very opposite, right? It's a very well-trained, uh, highly knowledgeable, technocratic uh, administration that I think is qualified to do so. And tackling these messy issues that have to do with human rights, uh, women's rights, um, and the kind of non-transactional things that require more investment, I think is a good way for the administration to show the shift back to Asia that's not just convenient. We'll just send more troops there, we'll just send more ships, we'll put more money. This shows a long-term investment that I think would be good for the administration and I think they're very capable of it. Uh, uh, so that's the incentive for the United States. For Japan, there's an incentive to revisit it. I know they wanna simply move on because they got these deals and a lot of money was put in and a lot of political capital, but the truth is we don't know that much about this, uh, the comfort women situation and forced laborers. The data is not just out there, but it will be found. Researchers are in the archives every day digging it up. We found new clips of, of the comfort women and Japan has to be able to, to confront that, right? Because if they're not having their hand on the wheel, they don't get to be part of the narrative and it's not gonna be in their favor. And so they, there's an incentive them, for them to participate as well. And for South Korea, the human rights dimension is there are not many comfort women left. And they have not achieved the justice for these women because how do we know? Because the women themselves feel that that's not the case. So there's a five, 10 year window where they have to be aggressive and maybe make concessions in order to get the Japanese and Americans to the table. So there's an incentive for all three sides to get together to do something uh, which is very difficult, but the problem has always been process, uh, not intention or goals. And if we could align the three allies together, I think a lot of good can be done. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, most interesting. I, I wondered if we could come back and you could ponder this as we move on with other presentations. Um, you know, you make very compelling arguments about that anti-Japanese um, element is not sufficient to explain uh, the pre, you know, the fact that there are previous agreements and that stickiness of the agreements may be part of the policy problem. Fair enough, and and why there should be a role of the U.S. I wondered if you if you consider a bit more, we could circle back to you on some of the arguments. I hear them mostly in Japan, but not only in Japan, uh, mostly in Japan, but not only in Japan, that really the trajectory of the three are, are going very different ways, that the, the asymmetrical interests that are now emerging in Northeast Asia mean that the compulsions for a close alignment between uh, Seoul and Tokyo are decreasing, not increasing and um, that these fundamental structural changes are part of the problem that makes policy stickiness uh, difficult on narrow arrangements such as uh, narrow historical issues rather than the entire relationship. But we can come back to it because I find it a very interesting uh, line of discussion and perhaps we can come back to it. But onward we go uh, to yet another extraordinarily interesting uh, article, and I was very uh, pleased to receive this one because, as I mentioned to Paul, uh, it was really a way of broadening out the alliance on issues of values and principles um, and issues that, that confront both societies domestically, not to mention what role they can play globally. Um, and that is um, uh, Kristen Wilson and Dr. Uh, Jackie Steele's paper uh, that looks at how the U.S. and Japan co can cooperate on democracy and equity to encompass gender and racial uh, justice issues. So with that, I think Kristen, you're going to speak first, followed by Dr. Steele. Yeah, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I just want to thank Paul and Satu for this opportunity. Um, and yeah, the piece by myself and Dr. Steele discusses centrality of social movements and civil society, specifically those surrounding gender and racial justice issues, to the further democratization and equity efforts in the US-Japan alliance. With the Biden-Harris administration, we have seen an increasing narrative on the need to revitalize American democracy, not only for domestic stability and prosperity, but with an understanding that democratic shortcomings at home threaten American credibility and the ability to influence and lead abroad. 
US-Japan alliance is viewed as the cornerstone for stability and promotion of democratic values in the Indo-Pacific. Yet recent news headlines that have caught international attention undermine the democratic leadership of both countries, highlighting their weaknesses on racial and gender justice issues. For example, in the US, we saw the attack on the Capitol, which brought to the fore discussions on the legacy of white supremacy and legacy violation of minority rights, especially for the black community. So we witnessed Black Lives Matter protests this summer and the reactionary force used against them. And recently we have seen attention paid to the increasing anti-Asian violence in the United States and elsewhere as a racist reaction to COVID-19, including the recent attacks in Atlanta, where I'm from, which highlight a historical violence lying at the intersection of racism and misogyny. In Japan, as they gear up for the Olympics, um, however, we witnessed the global reaction to the sexist comments made by former prime minister and Tokyo Olympic committee head, Yoshiro Mori, who claimed that women talk too much. And recently there was a slightly lesser headline of the Tokyo Olympics opening ceremony director stepping down over their misogynist comments towards a female Japanese celebrity, referring to her as Olympig. Uh, Japan also receives international condemnation regarding discriminatory treatment of non-Japanese permanent residents and their re-entry and entry rights to Japan during COVID travel restrictions. Yet with these attention grabbing headlines, we also see the strength and centrality of social movements in civil society within these countries that are demanding accountability, transparency, meaningful inclusion and policies that promote equity and justice. And indeed, these social justice movements and society groups are central to democratization efforts and to social cohesion. They help elevate the meaning of democracy beyond mere procedure. That is to say that they move beyond a typical definition of democracy simply as free and fair elections as the reality is that there's often profound entrenchment and bipartisan stranglehold in the US and power alteration between political parties almost never happens in Japan. But instead these movements shift the meaning and elevate the meaning of democracy and democratization to ways in which institutions of the state and political power meaningfully include and are responsive to the concerns of the full diversity of citizens and civil society. And given the long history of the US-Japan alliance, we are fortunate to have numerous languages, linkages between civil society actors in both countries who have collectively advocated for issues regarding rights and justice. Um, a little bit as Tom mentioned, we have seen this historically with the democratization of South Korea in the 1980s and the transnational linkages between grassroots NGOs and women's rights organizations, including in the US and in Japan, that together strengthen calls for restorative justice for the comfort women. They continue to insist on the necessary inclusion of these women's voices in negotiation and mediation processes, which as mentioned was historically not been done. As 1965 normalization treaty negotiated by the Korean dictator was conducted away from public view and the 2015 private agreement with then President Park and Prime Minister Abe was later declared delegitimate by President Moon. We've also seen these transnational linkages with the global reach of the Me Too movement and the Kutu movement and conversations around justice for sexual harassment in the workplace and for young women engaging in job hunting in Japan who are experiencing kind of rigid misogynist power differentials. And today, as we focus on resilience and recovery from the coronavirus pandemic, we know this will depend upon widespread social cohesion and grassroots social capital. Recovery from COVID is an important opportunity for the US-Japan Alliance to model how democracies are well suited to address social and economic precarities and structural inequalities that were revealed and exacerbated by the pandemic. Through their commitment to democratic principles, the US and Japan can demonstrate the ability of democracies to rebuild into prosperous, stable, inclusive societies. And civil society and social justice movements have essential expertise and lived experience that is needed to ensure the adoption of evidence-based policies that foster equity, justice, and power sharing to build these more equitable post-crisis economies and societies. We know that women and minority groups have borne the brunt of the pandemic in both countries uh, and intersectionality highlights how compounding marginalities of gender, race, and class and other factors are punishing certain groups in ways that are undemocratic Women in general have suffered the greatest uh, number of job losses as they are more likely to engage in precarious job contracts and work in informal sectors. The 140,000 jobs lost in the United States in December was entirely women of color and 73% of the initial job losses in Japan at the start of the pandemic were among women. All of which also compounds the increasing trend of the feminization of poverty in both countries, especially for single mothers who are largely women of color in the United States. And because we know that women are also taking on the burden of extra care responsibilities as globally women spend three times as many hours on unpaid care and domestic work as men. 
Um, these women often do so by obligation, not by choice. So these sacrifices that women and uh, minority groups are making will entail significant financial setbacks for their own personal savings, potential access to pensions, capacity to live in dignity as, as societies get older, especially in Japan. So these trends constitute a significant reversal of the hard-won gains made toward gender equality over the past 30 years of careful progress. And they're also a strong condemnation of the damaging legacy of structural racism to democratic advancement. But however, they also present a key opportunity for the US and Japan to revitalize their own global leadership and demonstrate the strengths and net benefits of a democratic system of self-government with a robust and diverse civil society that is committed to justice and equity. So thank you. And I would now like to defer to my co-author, Dr. Jackie Steele, for her comments. Great. And I think, thank you, for Kristen, for laying the table here. And I think if we think forward, uh, what we're really seeing um, from the Biden-Harris cabinet and also the efforts at institutionalizing diversity, uh, the new initiatives such as the White House Gender Policy Council, there's some really strong and hopeful signals um, to seriously tackle issues of racial and gender justice, and that really can move uh, forward on meaningful inclusion of civil society groups to revive democracy as they really do have expertise and deep lived realities that must be enriched into the policy conversation and the public policy outputs through law. In Japan, we would naturally want to also see uh, sort of a doubling down on more substantive and measurable improvements on gender equality indicators. Um, Japan has only but up to go for the gender gap internationally. Uh, and I think we can see greater performance in that area with support from the United States in this wonderful uh, US-Japan relationship and partnership moving forward. We could also see more efforts on the inclusion uh, and equity offered to racialized minorities, such as the Zainichi, Korean, Okinawans, the Ryukyu, the Ainu, uh, the Budokumin, who also suffer uh, a certain stigmatization. And I think uh, certainly within the global talent and uh, business communities within Greater Tokyo, we see uh, increasing raising uh, pressure and sort of uh, voices around mixed race Japanese and mixed race identity in Japan, uh, many of whom these individuals live at sort of an illegal limbo without, the la without um, recognition for dual nationality. Um, living within the country, but not having substantive belonging legally to be able to escape, uh, I guess, nationalism or sentiments around a foreign uh, national uh, passport holding. So both countries have their homework in terms of advancing democratic equality. And we certainly see this as an opportunity to really reestablish credible leadership on best practices that can really support other democracies across the Indo-Pacific and globally. Um, we know, uh, you know, as Canadian philosopher uh, James Tully has, has observed, democracy is really governed by the co-equal principles of popular sovereignty or majority rule, but also the rule of law and constitutionalism calls upon us to respect the rights of minorities and all individuals. So as we think forward, the implications for diversity, equity and inclusion work within companies, multinationals, it is really echoing one and the same social justice trend within public, the public sector and civil society. And these social movements really strengthen our, our economies, our ability to rebound from crisis, um, to seek resilience in the interdependence that this can offer. And I think most importantly, our message and takeaway is that we believe that only by aligning commitments on social justice, gender equality, diversity, and innovation to use democratic statecraft to also advance the rights of minorities, we can really build a prosperous modeling of democracy and the Japan-US alliance can really distinguish its political leadership and equitable governance model as very clearly distinct from the Chinese alternative. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Steele and, and Ms. Wilson. That was, uh, was really very uh, inspiring and useful. I, maybe we can come back to this, but you know, um, it's hard to disagree with the end states that we seek on, on racial and gender justice um, in both societies. Goodness knows we've got a long way to go. Uh, I guess my question is uh, that in observing the US-Japan alliance, either on democracy or external uh, applications of justice have been mixed, uh, whether in their respective foreign policies or certainly even cooperating bilaterally. And over the years, from 20 years ago, when I, 25 years ago, when I lived in Japan working on a democracy project, it always struck me that Japan was quite hesitant uh, to uh, try and inform other countries in Asia, much less anywhere else about issues of racial and, and gender and democracy and equality um, for reasons that you all as Japan experts know far better than I. 
but I always find it puzzling. And um, I wonder if you think there are some new uh, things to be found, new, new levers, new uh, mobilizations, new tools that make uh, work on gender and racial justice perhaps more promising than has been traditionally the case on pure, uh, you know, sort of free elections and democracy and equality and those kinds of issues. Uh, so I'd love to hear more about that. I made a mistake. Um, it's late in the evening here. I make no apology. I make an apology to my good colleague, uh, Paul Nadeau. I, I simply went straight to Kristen and, and Dr. Steele's paper and didn't give him a chance. So let me come back to Paul because he has also written an extraordinarily interesting piece on the partisan biases in US-Japan relations, real and perceived, I think, um, as he discusses. So Paul, can you, can you take us through Japanese-US uh, relations in the context of Republican and Democratic administrations? Sure. So it's a sensitive topic because you know biases are always sensitive, especially when they connect to partisanship. But you, having worked in the <clears throat> in the U.S. Senate and in the Japanese House of Representatives, having seen you work with legislatures in both countries, um, I can tell you it's real, uh, for better or worse. Um, and I've heard it from diplomats from both countries. I've heard it from staffers, legislative staffers, people on the street. Um, so it's tricky, it's sensitive, but it's real and it doesn't need to be, which is the, the frustrating thing. Um, so just to basically summarize what these biases are, what they mean, um, generally the Japan's Liberal Democratic Party, the, the majority party now, and it's been the majority party for all but a couple brief interregnums uh, since 1955, um, they get along better with Republicans um, and they're, much more hesitant about working with Democrats for a lot of different reasons. Um, they get along better with Republicans generally because Republicans want to talk about business and security. And those are the two things that Japan's LDP is most comfortable talking about. Democrats tend to want to talk about values and normative things. Um, and those are things that the LDP is much less comfortable, downright uncomfortable talking about. Um, so that's roughly where it comes from. You have a lot of other instances that sort of have confirmed these uh, biases among the LDP. Um, you know, basically, Japan wants to have what the UK has, what the United Kingdom has in the Atlantic, which is a special relationship with the United States. Um, they, I, you could almost go so far as to say that the LDP, the Japanese decision makers, already believe they have a special relationship with the United States. I'm not quite sure if the US sees it that way, uh, which isn't to say that they're under, Japan is undervalued as a partner, but I don't think they get that, the same uh, elevation of status, uh, you might wanna say. Um, but that what that means is that certain moments where Japan has appeared to be undervalued as a partner, uh, have really stung. And you know there are a couple instances that you'll always hear them uh, refer back to, like, Bill Clinton's uh, flyover in 1998 when he visited Beijing before he visited Tokyo, that stung. Um, they were also very frustrated with Barack Obama's uh, policy of strategic patience with North Korea and his failure to ratify the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And fair or not, I mean, the thing you have to remember is the US that these administrations have their own equities, their own interests in doing what they do. So fair or not, but these things are remembered and they're internalized and they're, they're, they become a sort of baggage, um, which is tricky because I think the LDP agrees with Democrats and Republicans on more things than they'll often say outright. Um, so I think they welcomed the Trump administration's framing of China as a threat, not completely, they did not, they, they they were not uh, they did not want the the how do I put this they, they want a multi Japan wants a more multi layered relationship with China that allows for cooperation on economics while also deterring uh, Chinese uh, military incursions gray zone incursions um, so they appreciated the Trumps the Trump administration's focus on the security threat but they weren't 
100% on board. That said, the Trump's uh, elevation of the Quad furtively uh, was all was another welcome step that needs to be acknowledged. And that's where the Democrats, um, Japan's LDP tends to agree with Democrats a little bit more because Japan wants to prefers alliances and multilateralism. They see that as the answer to facing the China threat for a lot of different reasons. Uh, it's because Japan can't match China militarily. They cannot deter China on their own. So their approach was, which is what you saw with the Abe administration since 2013. I hope I have that date right. I should have that date right. Um, was, it, was really Japan doubling down on the international rules-based order, um, deepening Japan's partnerships and alliances, um, advancing economic liberalization and institutionalism through TPP and then the CPTPP and as well as RCEP. And uh, you can even include the agreement with the UK and EU in there as well. Um, so that's, I think, where uh, the LDP and the Democrats are on the same page and where they can start to work together. Now, to that end, I think the Biden administration's uh, off to a good start in that regard, both by visiting um, Tokyo and Seoul before the meeting with China. Um, a lot of the figures in the Biden administration, Kurt Campbell, Jake Sullivan, are known commodities, uh, Tony Blinken as well. They're known commodities. They are much closer to Japan's uh, perception of China, which is not belligerent, but ca highly cautious. Um, I hesitate to say hawkish, but uh, you know, st strongly cautious, I'll put it that way, maybe. Um, now, the tricky thing for Japan at this point is that Abe, I think as we you get farther away from his second tenure as prime minister, he's going to look very unusual in the sense that you probably will not see another Japanese prime minister with that much political capital for a very long time. You know, political capital to push through legislation reinterpreting Japan's security laws, to pursue all these different uh, economic partnership agreements. We're already seeing with Suga that uh, he lacks that capital. He's having a much harder time, you know, even disciplining, uh, I believe this is probably Kristen's, uh, Ms. Wilson's uh, comment about Yoshiro Mori. Um, Suga's hands were tied. I mean, I don't think he, I was gonna say, I don't think he necessarily agreed with him probably might have agreed with him, unfortunately, which is its own problem. We can get to that later. Uh, but it was much harder for Suga to just say, okay, out you go, um, because he didn't have the political capital to do that. He depends, he doesn't have his own faction. He depends on the support of everyone else. And that's, you know, if, if Suga's hands are tied with, you know, a simple little kerfuffle like that, it's going to be much more, uh, much more firmly tied on a lot of other issues. And I think that's going to be a big problem for Japan uh, for a little bit longer. So what they're looking for from the Biden administration, I would probably say would be continuing the same course with China that we've seen, you know, since January. I think the they like what they've seen so far. Um, CP, and I know this is a politically sensitive topic, CPP, a return to CPTPP is, uh, would be the ideal. Uh, I know that's not realistic, but what Japan is looking for, is, and, and I think the region as a whole is looking for, is you know some kind of you know tangible U.S. investment, institutional, meaningful investment that shows that the U.S. is here. It's meaningfully invested in the region institutionally, and so maybe CPTPP isn't realistic, but there are other things. Uh, Agreements on digital governance are probably an ideal place to start. Um, and, you know, maybe a bilateral agreement with Japan that's as harmonious as possible with the provisions of CPTPP without getting you over there. Now, again, like I keep saying, that's all politically sensitive. You've got in the US, you've got your own equities you've got to deal with in the US Congress, God knows. But I, that, you know, even little things like that would go a long, long, long way towards reassuring Japan and reassuring the region as a whole. So, that basically covers my comments for now. Um, I'd be happy to take your questions. I'm looking forward to the conversation later on. Um, and again, thank you for your attentions. Thank you so much, Paul. We've discussed this before and certainly, you know, uh, the US-Japan relationship is rife with examples and anecdotes of 
uh, feelings about Republicans and Democrats. I, I wonder if you could just put on your plate a thought that's been occurring to me recently, whether Japan now doesn't face a double dilemma with the United States. And the double dilemma is this, there's consensus on China. Whereas before, maybe there wasn't consensus between Republicans and Democrats. In the um, message to the force, Secretary of Defense Austin called China the pacing threat. One could argue, one could argue based on the interim strategic guidance and the message to the force document, that in fact, the Biden administration came out swinging on China as hard, if not harder than the initial Trump administration. That in fact, China is considered the pacing not threat, not the double geostrategic competition with Russia. Uh, on the same token, uh, the new administration in the interim strategic guidance has a very uh, much uh, ignored or neglected uh, paragraph on how strategic compass, uh, competition encompasses cooperation with China and all the issues on which it could, there could be interest-based cooperation. So on the one hand, Japan faces a dilemma from the US that the Republicans and Democrats aren't split on China. They're very hard. But the other side of the flip coin of the dilemma, as you mentioned, between security and economics is Republicans and Democrats basically both don't like free trade. And neither are interested in institutionalized economic governance across the Asia Pacific, which to my mind structurally presents the US-Japan alliance with a kind of dilemma that asks Japan to do a lot that might put in jeopardy a multi-layered strategy towards China, but without the payoff of an institutionalized regional economic approach. And I wondered if you could sort of think through what that kind of uh, development might mean for the alliance. Anyway, it's just a thought that I've been playing around with and I, I thought I would uh, lay it out there. Our cleanup batter, since we are thankfully approaching baseball season, is Akensuke Yanagida. And he is um, a, a, a terrific scholar and we've interacted many times. Kensuke, great to have you here. And he's gonna talk about the need for the US-Japan alliance to cooperate with India in Indo-Pacific economic governance. Kensuke, welcome. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening and good morning from, from Japan. And uh, last year I was in Washington and doing visiting fellow at uh, East West Center. And uh, I'm very glad to yeah, see you again. And uh, yeah, thank you and Paul San uh, for giving me this opportunity. So uh, I want to uh, talk uh, from the economic perspective in the Indo-Pacific. And uh, uh, for the economic issues, uh, I think there are uh, mainly two uh, areas. And one is connectivity and the other one is trade. And uh, uh, regarding trade, like TPP is, uh, is a focus for Japan and trying to expand membership and maintain the momentum for like uh, uh, making the institutional institutionalizations uh, of the trade uh, in these regions. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, yeah, as uh, others mentioned, there's a less uh, chance or optimistic uh, for, the, for the United States to return to uh, TPP. Uh, but I think uh, there's a still uh, areas uh, Japan and the United States can work together uh, in trade. And, and, and from, uh, from the big pictures, uh, I think, uh, so my, uh, one of my favorite uh, book is, uh, is uh, George Kennan's, uh, and the, I think Kennan's containment wisdom is still relevant uh, today. And now there is a framework, uh, Quad, and US, uh, Australia, Japan, and also including India uh, as a partnership to, to do something or contain um, yeah, policies uh, towards China. And, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, so for Japan, uh, Japan uh, is promoting uh, the regional free trade agreement. So one is TPP, the other one is uh, RCEP. And RCEP is, uh, um, uh, is, a, is, a, is a trade agreement uh, with the ASEAN uh, member countries and with, uh, with six partner uh, countries. So Japan, China, Korea, and, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, 
uh, India, but India has withdrawn from uh, from the negotiation at the, at the last stage. So uh, now our set uh, negotiations have been concluded with 15 countries with not in India. And so, uh, uh, and, and the US uh, also uh, has a bilateral trade talk with, with India uh, on, on, on many issues. And actually uh, the both uh, uh, United States and Japan uh, face a similar uh, the issues vis-a-vis uh, -vis India on, on the trade negotiations. So this is where um, the two countries can cooperate together and uh, maybe approaches can be more coordinated. And well, um, so uh, I think uh, maybe I just uh, uh, talk a little bit about RCEP, what, what uh, is RCEP, what RCEP about? And I think in my assessment, uh, RCEP uh, negotiation outcome is uh, uh, was uh, was I think it was good. Uh, RCEP has uh, achieved substantial outcomes in terms of the level of liberalizations and also the uh, comprehensive uh, rules. And um, uh, you know, RCEP is regarded as a, a low low level, uh, and it's true uh, when you compare with like TPP. So uh, RCEP doesn't include uh, some of the elements that are uh, included in TPP, such as uh, state-owned enterprise and labor and uh, environment standards. But RCEP is uh, sufficiently uh, uh, high level of liberalizations and comprehensive in terms of rule uh, compared to like WTO, the way uh, higher than the WTO standards. And RCEP includes uh, like full fledged uh, investment liberalizations. Uh, and also, uh, RCEP has an uh, a element to address uh, some of the concerns uh, uh, regarding China, uh, China's unfair, uh, unfavorable uh, trade practices. So, uh, it has uh, chapters uh, on um, on the investment rules uh, prohibiting the performance requirements uh, such as local uh, procurement and 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 uh, forced technology transfer and actually this is the first time for china uh, to uh, include such element uh, in, in their investment agreement and also RCEP has a e-commerce uh, e-commerce chapters and this uh, so this is ensure that the uh, member countries cannot prohibit, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, prohibit, uh, cannot, cannot, cannot request uh, the uh, uh, the foreign uh, investment uh, to install uh, their, you know, uh, computers, uh, servers uh, in domestically, and also ensure the freedom of uh, data flow, cross border information, and. Uh, so regarding uh, India, so India has been part of RCEP uh, since the beginning. However, so it declares to withdraw from RCEP negotiations at the last stage. And, and I think there are mainly two reasons uh, for this. Uh, the one is, uh, is uh, India's uh, biggest concerns uh, that these trade liberalizations may lead to the uh, influx of cheap uh, products imports uh, from China and ASEAN into India. And this is something to do with uh, India's domestic uh, economic issues. Um, India is still uh, developing uh, countries and uh, especially manufacturing sector uh, is under uh, developed. Uh, Modi uh, administrations, uh, uh, he, uh, he's promoting uh, his uh, flagship uh, you know, project uh, you know, under the banner of Make in India and aiming to increase the share of manufacturing sectors uh, to 25% by uh, 2020. And uh, actually, uh, Modi administration is doing a good job, uh, you know, uh, up upgrading the uh, transportations and el electronic infrastructures, and also doing a series of reforms, tax reform, uh, land reform, and labor reforms. Uh, there are some, uh, so there is uh, outcomes uh, out of this uh, project. However, uh, the growth of the manufacturing sectors is not sufficient to absorb 
uh, the you know abundant uh, rivers, uh, rivers in India. So and uh, so yeah, so India still cons uh, concerned uh, ASEP might uh, strengthen India's competitiveness in the international uh, economy and trade, uh, but you know India's uh, may not be a uh, strong enough competitive enough to compete with uh, China or ASEAN. And other, other one is uh, uh, domestic political consider considerations. There are uh, many uh, stakeholders opposing to, to RCEP. So there's uh, uh, demonstrations against RCEP and so Modi administration, they have to pay attention to this political, uh, domestic political movement. And, and the US, uh, so US, uh, uh, so under the previous uh, Trump administrations had uh, a bilateral negotiations with uh, with India, and uh, and uh, there are uh, several concerns uh, on India's uh, trade policies. So the one is uh, India's recently uh, increasing the tariffs on on the uh, ICT related uh, products like a mobile phone and communication uh, equipment. And, and also India is uh, increasing the applied uh, tariff rate to the, the bound rate, uh, meaning that uh, um, it's still under the commitment of WTO, but India can uh, actually move, uh, can change the tariffs to, uh, to the upper bound. And, and uh, US and Japan and other uh, countries, they uh, uh, came together and uh, request WTO uh, for the uh, dispute settlement uh, of these uh, issues. And, and the uh, US uh, negotiating with, uh, with India uh, so uh, decided uh, to remove India from the GSP, the generalized system of preferences, uh, which gives duty-free tariff treatment for uh, qualifying uh, developing countries, but uh, yeah, removed. For, for for failure to provide equitable and reasonable market access. And there's a concerns on the trade and uh, uh, investment uh, on, on services and, and so on. So, um, so issues uh, the facing India in RCEP negotiations and the US-India uh, bilateral negotiation have uh, uh, actually similar uh, structures, uh, common, uh, much in common. So, so yeah, so my message is Japan and US can work uh, together to ensure India can meet the requirement of rule-based and free and fair economic governance in the Indo-Pacific. And I think a successful conclusion of the US-India bilateral negotiation is important uh, in the sense that it may uh, be able to give uh, India the confidence uh, to promote the trade liberalizations. And of course, uh, uh, in, in realistic, realistically speaking, the economic assistance and the cooperation uh, will be important, uh, you know, provided to India, and, and because uh, in order for India to realistically fulfill its role and the responsibility and its own own stated aspiration of economic progress, it must gain uh, the internal and external uh, cooperations, and the Quad uh, framework. Uh, can be uh, can be it can be utilized, and so um, yeah. So through through Quad, uh, maybe U.S. Japan uh, can step up economic cooperation jointly with other uh, partner countries uh, in areas like quality infrastructure, the digital technologies, and also supporting infrastructure and human resources development uh, in India. So strong India is important for India itself and also it's crucial to US and Japan's interest. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Yanagida-san. That's uh, terrific. And, and the very uh, fact that you've taken on the topic of India in the US-Japan alliance uh, shows you how the alliance is both topically as well as geographically expanding because 10, 12, 15 years ago, we certainly wouldn't have been discussing uh, that may be some of the security and diplomatic elements, but certainly not economic governance elements. But I would put to you this question. Other speakers, I would ask you to please look in the Q&A section uh, for questions uh, that have been posed by participants. 
and see who would wish to uh, engage on them. And then I'll turn to that. But Janagita san, you know, I've been toying with this idea that India is now uh, in an unusually sweet spot. Uh, and let me try out the argument. The argument is um, that the US wants to decouple from China and even Japan wants to decouple from China in some degree. Let's, we can debate forever about how much and on what and what areas and supply chains and all that. On the other hand, China wants to make a pitch to join economic governance in Asia. It's already part of APEC. It's already part of RCEP. It might want to join CPTPP, but we can probably delay that uh, via Australia and Tokyo. So there are lots of options. So if you posit the notion that India can avoid making um, deals or concessions to economic governance, it can rely on the US, Japan, Australia, and others to help its nationalist economic agenda rather than giving up to liberalized governance economic agenda. And I'm not advocating, please don't misunderstand that I'm advocating that position. I'm simply as an analyst asking whether India doesn't have more to gain from people wanting to get out of China and less reliant on China and it can pick up as in the quad meeting for production of vaccines, rather than making concessions that are very difficult domestically in democratic nationalist India. So something for uh, us to discuss and think about as we go forward, uh, just posit that to you. But who would like to kick off on the questions that have been posed by Mr. Reinch? And uh, oh, Yoichiro Sato, our good colleague uh, at Ritsumeikan University. Um, anyone want to try a, a hand at those questions first, and then we'll come back to a round robin on some of the issues raised and give you a chance too. Anyone? Yeah, uh, Hillary, yeah. Take the Okinawa. I was hoping you would take the Okinawa. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that is a great question. Um, and I, I think you know what I would like to emphasize is that I fully agree that it's important to honor the Okinawan people and open a dialogue and be fully transparent with them. Um, I would like to just present an alternative, alternative interpretation of some of the facts laid out. So it's true that there was a 72% 70, voted no uh, on the Futema replacement facility. However, I think with that particular referendum, you had about 50% turnout. So if you want to turn it on its head, it's like, well, only 35% of registered or eligible voters uh, oppose FRF. So there's other ways to interpret the numbers. Number two, the way the question was worded made no reference to closing Tenma Air Base. So anecdotally, with Okinawans I've spoken to over the last three and a half years, closing, Heno, uh, sorry, closing Tenma Air Base is much higher priority than um, preventing the construction of the Patenma replacement facility. So um, if the referendum was worded in such a way that, do you support the Patenma replacement facility fee at, facility at Hanoko if it directly leads to the closure of Patenma Air Base, I think you get a much different uh, result. And again, successive US and Japanese administrations have said there is no alternative but uh, to the Henoko replacement facility um, if you want to close the Fatima Air Base. So as a, as a career bureaucrat, I may uh, sort of lack sort of a, the vision thing. I'll leave that to the activists. But given the parameters that the Henoko replacement facility has been uh, the centerpiece or the only solution, the only way to close Fatima Air Base, I think you sort of need to work within those parameters. I've not seen a realistic alternative proposed, um, uh, nor have I seen any realistic way to lobby either government to accept an alternative. Mm -hmm. um, as to the report uh, published by CSIS, I mean, again, a a as a bureaucrat, I can only sort of you know go on what I've been told or what I've seen from both the US military and the Japanese defense ministry that you know, a, a completion date of somewhere in the 2030s, mid, early to mid 2030s is realistic. Um, of course, the delays are unfortunate um, and nobody likes them, but I, I, I have not seen um, 
sort of engineering or science data that would that says that it will never be completed. Um, you know, I, I, not to get too far into the weeds, but you know, there's a lot of talk about the the ground on the Henoko Bay being too soft or not stable. What I've been told, again, both by, by US and Japanese officials, that this is a very common problem. You have this with airports constructed all over Japan. You have the Nagoya airport and the Kansai airport, which are both sort of on landfills, and they needed to revise the engineering plan at some point due to soft ground. So take that for what it's worth. But but so that's, that's I think, given, given sort of the parameters of the Hinoko replacement plan is going forward, um, the plan was designed to alleviate the impact of U.S. forces on the more heavily populated parts of the island. I think the best way to go forward then is to is to sort of say this is a plan, this is why we're doing it. And to to the to the reader's um, question, to honor the Okinawans by at least giving them a full and open discussion of um, what the plan is meant to do and what uh, sort of capabilities the replacement facility at Henoko will allow the Alliance to, to um, continue to have amongst the changing security environment in the Indo-Pacific. So I hope that wasn't too long-winded, but. Um, no, thanks. And I, I really should have read out, uh, John Rice is right. I should have read out the question because I, for a moment, forgot that we have folks on uh, YouTube who cannot see the questions that are in the Zoom chat. So that was my failure. And the questions, as you could probably have guessed, were relating to would the uh, replacement facility be built on Okinawa and how to address the issue of the 2019 uh, prefectural rec referendum vote. Uh, but Hillary answered that, but John, thank uh, Reich, thank you for uh, pointing out that I didn't read them. Let me read the next one. And maybe Yanagita-san, you wanna come in on this? And I've got a question here, I think right down the alley for Professor Tom Lay as well. Um, and maybe Jackie or Kristen want to address uh, um, an, an, uh, one here on uh, the Myanmar issue, because it's not quite the gender and racial justice, but it does speak to your interest in how the US and Japan can cooperate on democracy and equity promotion. Uh, Yoichiro Sato's question is a very comprehensive talk balancing military security and economic interests of Japan. U.S. already enjoys low tariffs on meat without signing CPTPP. I assume he obviously means low tariffs on meat uh, exported to Japan. Would a bilateral free trade agreement with Japan consistent with TPP lead U.S. to drop automobile tariffs without any additional Japanese concession in return? And maybe Yanagida-san would have some thoughts on that. I mean, I've always understood that part of the attraction of TPP from the US perspective wasn't so much the arrangements with the other 10 parties of the TPP or 11 part, or 10 parties. It was really that it was a bilateral FTA nested in a regional agreement, comprehensive agreement where we already had an FTA with Australia and Singapore. And so the real give was to some extent the winners, if you will, on the general equilibrium model of, of the TPP was Vietnam and Malaysia, not the US or not Japan. And the big winner for Japan and the US was finally nesting their bilateral, difficult bilateral TPP in this regional agreement. What do you think, Yanagita Sensei? Uh, and, okay, yes, uh, thank you very much for, for the questions. I think uh, I'd like to respond to the uh, the questions previously raised from from you, Satu san, yeah. about the nas national uh, nationalist uh, India, and uh, I think this is an interesting uh, point. And uh, in my view, that the yes, there is a very strong nationalistic movement in India. Uh, so when Modi uh, said that India uh, is going to withdraw from ASEP, so he was like regarded as hero. So, wow, Modi, you, you're really good, go, 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 something like this. And, um, but I think India uh, really uh, is, you know, compared to the, the economic development uh, of China, is still, uh, you know, uh, far behind. And uh, India, I think, should really focus on the economic development first uh, before uh, really doing something on the security uh, issues. And in this sense, uh, I think nationalistic movement is uh, uh, 
it's uh, I think it, you know driving India in the opposite uh, directions, and I think uh, in order to change uh, this kind of uh, directions, I think I think for India, uh, I think they they need to to really uh, get the internal also external uh, assistance corporations. Mm. Uh, yes, that, that's my yeah. Change the directions, mm. and and, uh, and the questions from uh, from uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, on, on the U.S. Japan bilateral uh, trade agreement. Uh, in my understanding, uh, so there's a bilateral uh, trade agreement, but it has a uh, uh, two two stages. The first stage is uh, is about the the tariff. And the second stage is about other other rules, and I think only the first stage negotiation was completed, but the second stage, uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, it has started, it, you know, even started. And uh, but uh, this U.S. Japan bilateral trade agreement, uh, I think there's uh, not much new uh, beyond the TPP. So the level of concessions is. Uh, think it's it's up to the you know, TPP and so far there's only you know tariff element and there's no uh, rules so I'm, I'm not sure uh, where this bilateral negotiation is going for, uh, forward mm -hmm. under under the Biden administration and the TPP uh, it's not only the economic uh, aspect but also the security aspect so strategic strategic meaning. So I think TPP is uh, different from um, from the bilateral uh, agreement in this aspect. Thank you, Yanagida-san. Um, I want to make sure that Jackie Steele and, and Sarah Siloff uh, come in on the questions I posed to them during the course of their presentations. So um, um, wh why don't we start with Jackie? But I also want to just, Tom, Professor Tom Lay, in the chat session, if you can read it, there's a question that says that South Korea does not represent all of Korea, so cannot settle colonial issues with Japan. And US has historical issues with war crimes against civilians during World War II and with Korea during World War. So how can US manage Japan and South Korea on history? So could we come back to you after we hear from Jackie and Sarah? Um, thank you so much. I wanted to plant that question with you to give you time to consider it. Yes, uh, Jackie. Uh, Dr. Steele. Yes, great. Thank you. And, and thank you for the question that you've raised. And I think I think one of the, the main issues, um, and perhaps speaking as a Canadian here, I, I think that we need to think about soft power and, and looking to sort of the, the quiet consistency we've seen probably out of Canada um, on really pushing forward on evidence-based policymaking that is intersectional and, and taking sort of a diversity lens to be mainstreamed into statecraft. I think there's lots of learnings to be had for both the United States and Japan in that area. Um, and I think certainly you can look at the, the, the government's response around COVID-19 in particular out of Canada um, in really fleshing out that rigorous analytical frame. Um, but I think broader than that sort of evidence-based stra strategy, I think we need to admit there's a problem, right? I mean, I think the first step is saying, we've seen the echoes of BLM. We, we know there is this problem of, of white supremacy in the United States. We know there is an issue of male supremacy in Japan that is, we're struggling to, to deal with for, for many, many years, many, many decades, frankly. Um, and the Mori scandal really revealed that. And these are echoing internationally. No, everyone knows, right? So when you're sneezing into the part, one part of the pool, to use an analogy, you're sneezing into the whole pool. And it contaminates the whole pool. And I think we can't separate out the foreign policy and domestic policy issues, which is our main point. But I think also for thinking to representative democracy in advanced democracies as we know it has still been very top down. Elected representatives are kind of above the people, above civil society, representing in ways that maybe isn't horizontal enough. So how do we democratize representative democracy further to say we need multi-stakeholder coalitions? We need a logic of DNI or DENI that's co-creating together for these coalitions for change. For democratic inclusion, and I think uh, we can we can look to I mean Kristen's work on uh, women, peace, and security, and how women's roles is essential to stability and peace. Or if we think about you know the 10th anniversary of Tohoku disaster, um, 
my work has been on women's leadership at the grassroots in Tohoku and how that has essential to the rebuilding process and essential to resilience uh, long term for the economy, for recovery, and for just building back better. And so I think uh, these lessons really teach us that we need to really think more seriously about what we're co-creating uh, in these relationalities. And I think uh, I think there's only we've only you know to to go forward. And I think to tie it to the Myanmar question that was raised. We're, there's different stages of democratization, and I think you know advanced democracies and certainly the the U.S. Japan alliance can, as as you know, leaders need to think about the substantive meaning of representative democratic institutions, driving the change and working with civil society and transnational social justice. And I think there are different stages of just consolidating procedural democracy and having the respect for election results really stick. And I think uh, you know the the alliance can really echo. The importance of both facets of those those kind those pieces in that strategic part of democracy as the best model. Thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious now that we have uh, six minutes, and I want to make sure that we get in. And there's another question um, been posed to. So let me turn now to uh, Ms. Seeloff, Sarah Seeloff, on the subnational elements of the U.S.-Japan relationship to address that query, and then give Professor Lay an opportunity to answer the question that was posed in the chat session. Please, Ms. Silo. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Lamaya. You had asked about how cities are attracting people um, in Japan. And so I'm, I'm gonna be brief here, but I just wanna note that there is some really interesting work going on uh, in that a lot of cities are leading with work. As uh, Sean had mentioned, workation facilities are really helping to bring city dwellers into rural areas uh, mm -hmm. and bring their skills, help them form relationships. I think in my, uh, based on my research as a Council on Foreign Relations Hitachi Fellow over the past year, uh, what I've seen is that some of the most successful cities really pursue social integration support, helping to really embed these newcomers in the community. Mm -hmm. And that's often paired with either support for entrepreneurial activities or training. Um, so two examples that come to mind are Manazuru, which is a small town in Kanagawa Prefecture, uh, which has a, a city funded tech lab in an old sushi restaurant. But the city has really set the stage. It's the private sector uh, and entrepreneurial individuals who are really running with it uh, and are a big source of innovation there. But the city has also supported them by going out of its way, not to provide cash subsidies, which is notable, mm -hmm. uh, but to support by means of you know, social integration, making introductions. Um, it's really technical assistance, if you will. Uh, Suzu City in Ishikawa Prefecture is another great example. Um, really interesting, really isolated uh, community in many ways, but has really uh, embraced its agricultural heritage and is trying to develop uh, a new model, new models um, of sustainable agriculture. And that's really attracted a lot of attention. Um, I just also want to note that as an American economic development practitioner, it's been very interesting to see that growth and innovation are not necessarily one and the same in many of these communities, that success doesn't necessarily mean growing back to the level of peak population, which might have existed as far back as the 50s, uh, that instead it means asking the question, how can we preserve quality of life? How can we maintain public services uh, and economic function? And maybe we'll also try to grow an experiment, right? But uh, there's not necessarily, I think in the most successful innovative communities, what you see is a recognition that growth does not necessarily equal more, peer, more people, period. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this has resonance in the United States as well, because we see many places that are impacted by economic transitions. The Rust Belt is one example, but Sean and I both come from the Pacific Northwest and point to a number of former timber communities communities that have really been impacted. Um, and I think Sean might actually have a, a, a good example of timber innovation to just kind of link this all together. Sean, did you have an example? Just very briefly, uh, wanting to be respectful of everyone's time. And, and Sarah and I allude to this in our paper, but, but one, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about a new timber technology, cross laminate timber, CLT. And that's something that we bring up. This is really a uh, something that many timber towns, especially in the Pacific Northwest and other uh, timber communities, Canada certainly, uh, other countries in Europe have really honed in on as a major focus for economic revitalization, but not just. Uh, Secretary Vilsack under the Obama administration made this a priority at USDA. And in Japan, uh, back in 2015, then Minister uh, Shigeru 
Ishiba uh, was heading up a ministry for rural revitalization and singled that out as an opportunity for Japanese communities. And, and that's one, one of the, the examples that we point to in terms of merging things like this with these, these existing very established and effective subnational networks can open up some very fascinating new doors uh, between Japan and the US, not just for economic revitalization, but also these are, these are carbon sinks to help reduce emissions. Uh, so there's, um, there's a lot more research that could be done on this, but these are the kinds of things that, that Sarah and I are very eager to highlight. Yeah, I, I hope we can follow up on that, Sarah and Sean, because um, I've been working with some state and local officials and groups and uh, there's some very interesting cross collaboration on how, uh, what are the incentive structures, uh, growth, innovation, cash, uh, social integration, uh, models that are being used for perhaps different reasons. Uh, and and um, it'd be something that I can tell you some of the folks um, in state and local government that I've been reaching out to uh, would be quite interested in comparing and seeing if there aren't some lessons learned. Um, and if we can do some kind of a little bit social science project of uh, sort of weighting some of the variables and controls on size of city, uh, size of population, kind of demographic base, we might be able to look at maybe two, three pairings uh, that we could uh, support to bring together and, and see if there aren't lessons learned and applicable elsewhere. So I'd be keen to follow up with that, but let me not run on. You know, all of your projects are so darn fascinating that I could spend a, a long evening. But let me uh, now turn to Professor Lei, uh, because I think he uh, was going to answer the question that he saw. Now, you've seen this question, Tom, right? And I read out the main elements so those watching on YouTube could also know what you're going to respond to. Please. Sure, I'll, I'll try to address this quickly. Your question in that one, because it's related. You know, your question earlier about are the trajectories of the three countries going in different directions? I, I, I think generally not. I mean, ultimately, if we're look, talking at the government level, what do governments care about? They want two to 4% growth a year. That's Japan, 2% if it's lucky. It wants autonomy from China. Uh, and that's generally what they want. So they align more so than they differ. And if we're talking about civil society and businesses, businesses want to make sure supply chains aren't disrupted by political issues. And civil society understands the importance of each side. So I don't think they really misalign. It's about finding where, uh, framing it in a way where stakeholders don't turn into spoilers. That means you have to give them incentives to participate. For the question by uh, David, uh, it's a great question and it's true. South Korea does not represent all of, uh, uh, all of Korea. And so, but they are uh, de facto two different states now. And so you work with one state and you come up with an agreement then. And then eventually when North Korea, you know, becomes part of the international community where they're interested in engaging in this kind of reconciliation, then you deal with that down the line. It, uh, the fact that they're two separate states doesn't prevent that. And actually that was the 1965 agreement where South Korea was recognized as the Korea uh, by Japan. And that's why you work with them first. Uh, when it comes to the US you know, history, uh, actually the article that I'm working on looks at why the US should engage and I compare reconciliation America with post-World War II East Asia, whether the US has a moral responsibility. I think your point has two dimensions of it. One is the normative, like, is it hypocritical that the United States would engage into it because it has its problems? Well, practically it hasn't been an obstacle for Japan, US relations, Korea, Japan relations. So that doesn't prevent them from engaging with them there. When it comes to, uh, you know, the, um, is it an obstacle? The US has been able, sure, the US on the record does not, put its fingers on the scale, its hand on the scale on previous negotiations, but the US has influenced previous uh, negotiations, including the 2015 one. So it, it practically, it, it didn't prevent them from working with them. So uh, I think you raised up a good point, but I don't think these are obstacles for the US to engage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we have uh, blown through our 90 minutes. Unfortunately, can't dig in more to the questions, but. I have to say, I do an awful lot of Zoom calls, conferences, seminars, presentations, what have you. And this is one of the most wide ranging around the bilateral relationship that I've been engaged with for quite some time. And for that, I'm deeply grateful because it's uh, because of your very interesting takes. And it's again, a reminder of just how wide scoped, deep, and expansive the US-Japan relationship has become uh, from, you know, to be fair, um, 
this may, I'm going to get myself in trouble, but I'm going to say it. You know, Japan US relationship oftentimes was a little bit insider baseball, right? A little bit kind of wonky Washington, uh, you know, the managers of the alliance, the, uh, the, the, the priesthood of, of the alliance managers. But in these vibrant, large democratic societies, imperfect, goodness only knows how imperfect both sides, but it does show you the range of things that they can cover and the, a range of discussions they can have. So I'm really grateful to Paul uh, for his cooperation, to all of you authors uh, for participating in this effort. And I'm looking forward to a building on this with future conferences, dialogues, and uh, projects. And if you have suggestions, uh, I've suggested one uh, to Sarah and Sean, but there could be many, I could think of many others in speaking with you. Um, to follow on this work, I look forward to engaging with you and I hope you'll keep in touch. I'm not hard to find. Uh, my email is readily available. Anyone will have them, Gensuke, uh, Sean, Paul, uh, you have my email. And uh, to our participants, either on YouTube or Zoom, I thank you for joining us wherever you are. It's been uh, really terrific. And I envy those of you in Japan getting ready for cherry blossom season. Uh, I only wish I could be there. So be well, be safe. And thank you again for writing and for participating in this workshop. Good evening to you all from Washington and good day to you on the other side of the pond. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone.